And sometimes, perhaps the army psychologist, or someone, I'm sorry, perhaps the army psychologist, might invite her to deploy certain strategies that would enable her to do what at present she finds impossible to do. But I hope it's clear that if Fred said to Jasper that he couldn't, that he could, that he, Jasper, could in fact pass by the injured cyclist if only he tried hard enough, if he said, look, I'll help you, put your hand over your eyes and take my hand, I'll lead you away, I hope it's clear that if Fred had said anything like that, he would have betrayed a serious misunderstanding of the kind of impossibility that Jasper expressed, as serious, as serious indeed, as ludicrous as someone who might have responded to Martin Luther when he said, triggering the Protestant Reformation, here I stand, I can do no other, if someone had said, well, why, don't, why not give it a go? You might not find it so hard. <laughs> well, someone who expresses that kind of impossibility, as Jasper did, how can I not help this person, is not confessing that his will is in the grip of a passion that is so strong that he can't resist, though his head tells him that perhaps he should. To the contrary, to find it in this way impossible to turn one's back on someone in need is itself a heightened awareness of what it means for a human being to be in such need. And this now is the crux of my case about the nature of political necessity. Elaboration of that awareness, elaboration of it from the point of view of someone who, like Jasper, can't turn their back on someone in need, who can't just walk away, even though, of course, there's nothing physically wrong with his feet, and his feet are not, so to speak, psychically nailed to the spot by an emotion so strong he can't resist. Elaboration of that awareness reveals the distinctive moral character of that necessitated responsiveness to a person's need. It reveals the distinctively moral character of this kind of compassion, conceived now not as an overwhelmingly strong emotion, the passion of compassion, as Hannah Arendt once called it, but as a form of answerability, whose nature is conditioned through and through by that kind of necessity. And now, when a politician lucidly responsive to the imperatives of her vocation says she must do what morally she must not do, then I believe elaboration of what it means for her to do that, what she must not do, or what it would be for her to fail to do it, reveals the distinctive kind of value with which that necessity is interdependent. It elaborates a form of responsibility indeed, different from moral responsibility, and which has been known to Western political thought from ancient times, from the writings of Plato through Machiavelli, but I mean the real Machiavelli, not the demonic cynic of popular imagination, through to Max Weber. Israeli politicians accept, appeal to that kind of necessity when they said that any other state would do as Israel had done. But I do not, in fact, think they felt it. Or if they did, they should not have, because the situation wasn't one, if clearly understood, to which they should have responded as though under the requirement of the kind of necessity that I just sketched. They could not say clear-sightedly that there was nothing else that they could do, unless they meant a conditional necessity, of course. For example, nothing else they could do if they were to win an election, or nothing else they could do if they were to teach Hamas a lesson it would not soon forget. But I think the conflict with Hamas and other enemies like Hezbollah and Iran, who explicitly assert the intention to destroy her, generates a semi-permanent sense of that distinctively political necessity in Israeli political life, often distorting it. Hamas's, and that's partly why, what I meant when I said that from Israel's point of view, Hamas's commitment to her destruction was written on every Qassam rocket that was fired at her. And, I think, and I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, it's often not properly understood when people discuss her response and reactions to her response. Of course, rockets of the kind that were fired, indeed any other rockets that Hamas might acquire in the near future, can't threaten Israel's existence. But fired continuously as they were before December, they can provoke Israel into responding as it did. Such provocation is, of course, a gamble. But Hamas knows, and Hezbollah knows too, that however brutally Israel responds, it can't use all the force it has at its disposal to compel them to surrender. They can therefore count on proclaiming themselves victorious. They do so plausibly, however, only in the eyes of those who fail to remember 
that it was not the courage or military prowess of Hamas fighters, I'm not denying that they had it, but it was not the courage or military prowess of Hamas fighters that prevented their annihilation. It was Israel's observance, relative and inadequate though it may have been, of just the kind of moral and legal restraints that she's accused of having no regard for whatsoever. As things stand, and this was easily predictable and often enough indeed predicted, Hamas lived to fight another day with its prestige enormously enhanced. Throughout the world, Israel is hated even more deeply. Scepticism about her legitimacy grows together with claims that the two-state solution is no longer feasible, even if it were ever desirable, and that there should be instead a secular state of Jews and Palestine. Palestinians, in which the Palestinians will constitute the majority. It's hard to resist the thought that Israel fell into a trap, as it did in Lebanon only a few years before and under the same Prime Minister. Well, I want now to discuss briefly two significant developments that occurred after Israel withdrew from Gaza in January. The first is the increasing attacks on Israel's legitimacy, that often show themselves in calls for a one state between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. And the second is the demand that Israeli politicians and soldiers be prosecuted for war crimes, if that is at all possible. It's now increasingly accepted, and rightly I believe, that it was a comforting illusion of the Zionist left to believe that for the most part the moral corruptions in Israel's, nat- in Israel's nat- national life began after the intoxicating victories of '67. The revisionist historians, so-called because they forced a revision of the early Zionist narrative about the nature and foundation of the state, have at the very least shown that there is a strong case for believing, I say at the very least have shown this, that there's a strong case for believing that between March 1948 and January 1949, the Jewish leadership aimed to rid the new state of enough Arabs to ensure that it would be a Jewish state. Benny Morris was one of the first Israeli historians to do so. Indeed, he argues that they could not have been a Jewish state without the expulsion from it of most non-Jews, who in this case were Arab Palestinians. I put it that way to make clear that Morris does not believe that Jewish racist hostility to the Arabs was the prime reason the Arabs were expelled. They were expelled and had, he believes, to be expelled if the Jewish state was really to be a Jewish state. And this has been a hard claim for Israelis and friends of Israel to accept, because if it's true, it means that the expulsion of the Palestinian Arabs was not an avoidable injustice in the creation of the state. But Morris also makes clear, in the ways that some other revisionist historians like Ilan Pape do not, that the reason why the Palestinian and other Arabs rejected the petition of Palestine that formed the basis for the state created by the United Nations was not because it gave to Arabs, who constituted by far the majority of the population, the smaller part of the land, thus partitioned. They didn't reject it because it was unfair. They rejected it for the same reason they rejected the Peel Report of 1937, which assigned to the Jews only 20% of the land, 70 to the Arabs and 10 to the British. That reason was why they were, the, re, the reason they rejected it was that they were not prepared to tolerate in the land of Palestine a Jewish presence with political institutions that gave expression to the identity of Jews as a nation or as a people, institutions that would, in in most circumstances, be the institutions of state. True, there has been much controversy about when the idea of a state rather than just of a homeland became a firm intention in the heart of the Zionist establishment. The consensus seems to be forming that it was earlier rather than later. But that is irrelevant, I think, to an account of Palestinian and other forms of Arab rejectionism, which often at the time had as much to do with Islamic hatred of Jews as it did with Arab nationalism. Some Israelis and many Palestinians refer to the expulsion of most of the Palestinian population as ethnic cleansing. Indeed, Pape has written a book called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, That, I think, is an unfortunate phrase with which to try to bring Jews to a reckoning for the crimes that were part of the establishment of the state and which some Israelis, now in ministerial positions, are again tempted to commit. 
Talk of ethnic cleansing is bound to bring the Holocaust to the minds of people, six million of a people, six million of whom were murdered in the spirit of cleansing the world of vermin. Two things should be noted. Firstly, the Jewish leadership had no wish, certainly had, did not form an intention to destroy a people. Secondly, the sense in which they wanted the state to be Jewish was, for the most part, free of any desire for racial or ethnic purity. Atrocities that were committed were not in any systematic way the expression of a murderous determination to ensure ethnic purity. Racism was partly the reason Arabs were morally invisible to many of the early settlers and was therefore partly the reason why those settlers could believe they were the vanguard of a people without a land, coming to land without a people. And later racism played a part in the treatment of Arabs and Sephardic Jews. Terrible though it was, however, the expulsion of the Arabs was not genocide, nor for the most part was racism its motive. Neither justice nor realism, in my judgment, requires someone who acknowledges the crimes that were part of Israel's foundation and that continue to this day to seek Israel's replacement by a binational state. The, cl the claim that justice requires it is often in part, but a crucial part, supported by the claim that, a Zion but that the Zionist, uh, Zionism is a colonial settler enterprise that dispossessed as did other such enterprises in Australia, for example, the indigenous inhabitants of the colonised lands. I fear what I'm about to say will offend many people, but I'll say it nonetheless because I think it's very important. I think it's misleading in the context of the discussion of Israel as a Jewish state to call the Palestinian Arabs the indigenous inhab inhabitants of the land. If you put it that way, identifying or, and running that together with the idea that Israel is a colonial settler society, then you will invite the thought that the Jews stand in much the same relation to the Arab population of Palestine as the white settlers stood in, to the Aboriginal population of Australia or to the Indian populations of America or Canada, for example. It's a thought, many people have it, that ignores the complexity of the Jewish relation to Palestine and indeed of Jewish identity, which is travestied in the claim that it's essentially a racial concept that became racialist in its Zionist development. I'm sure that no Jew could justifiably say flatly that in returning to Palestine she was returning to the land from which she had been exiled in biblical times, though indeed many are tempted to say just that, especially the settlers. Nor, however, could a Palestinian Arab justifiably respond to her flatly by saying, no, you are foreign settlers. The strong feeling of many Israeli Jews that living in Israel marks a kind of return takes nonsensical and sometimes very dangerous forms. But it's not always nonsense and not always dangerous, not at any rate to someone who believes in a two-state solution. Insofar as one acknowledges that justice does not require Jews to become mendicants for a place in what, what was Palestine, insofar as one believes they have a claim to be there, even if one believes it's a claim only to a homeland rather than to a state, or only to be in a one-nation state, then that claim is partly based, their claim to be there is partly based, on a relation to the land which is falsified, if Jews are described, as the non-indigenous inhabitants. Are they therefore the indigenous inhabitants? To say that would be even more misleading. And one should therefore conclude, I think, that the concept of an indigenous inhabitant hinders rather than helps thinking clearly about the conflicting claims of Arab and Jews to the same territory. And in this connection, it's important to note something when one reads writers who advocate a one-state solution, writers like Jacqueline Rose, for example, who enlist in their support earlier anti-Zionists like the theologian sorry, early, a, earlier anti-state Zionists uh, like the theologian and philosopher Martin Buber or the founder of the Hebrew University, Yehuda Magnus or the philosopher and political theorist Hannah Arendt. Rightly or wrongly, these people did not believe the Jews who came to mandate Palestine should, morally speaking, have petitioned the Palestinian Arabs for their right to settle there. I think I understand why people 
desire quite desperately an alternative to the nation state and its many frightening corruptions. Nonetheless, it strikes me as astonishing, even giving all due credit to idealism, that it should be Israel of all nations upon whom they call to abandon the protection offered by her sovereign control over armed forces in order to join with a people, most of whom hate her, in a new and dangerous experiment in political association. And indeed to do it while she is surrounded by states whose populations and sometimes whose leaders call for her destruction. States in which anti-sedimentism of sometimes the foulest kind has been taught for generations. Let such experiments begin elsewhere. In Europe, perhaps, I hear Israelis say, and they're right to say it. Why do European intellectuals who press for the creation of a one, one state between the Mediterranean uh, and the Jordan River, why don't, they enjoy, why don't they urge the Germans to embark on a political adventure in nationhood and thereby perhaps redeem some of the harm they did to humanity? Had I more time, I'd talk of the importance of international law in curbing the evils that flow from the possession of such force as only nation states can now wield in order to protect the distinctive institution and ways of living that shape the identity of a people. The Holocaust perpetrated amongst the most civilised nations of Europe made Jews understandably hostile to the idea that a community of nations should judge them, constituted as such a community by international law. In various ways that hostility shows itself in Israel's political postures and it seems to me that it could hardly be otherwise. Understandably, therefore, Israel has tended to be sometimes contemptuous of international law and even of the very idea of it. And that brings me to the question, should Israeli politicians and soldiers be prosecuted for crimes committed during the invasion of Gaza in the unlikely event that it should prove practically possible? The first part of my answer is easy, and I would hope uncontroversial not unless Hamas is prosecuted alongside her. The second part is more controversial. Israel's crimes should, I believe, be investigated and given their proper names. That will be difficult, since the truth of many allegations against the soldiers will depend on how the soldiers accused in those allegations saw things. Because Israel has refused to cooperate with the independent bodies investigating those alleged crimes, it's very hard to see how many of the allegations can be secured. In my judgment, it's understandable that Israel does not cooperate with those investigating committees and commissions, and in many cases it's justified that she doesn't, because the bodies, especially those from the UN, have so often been discredited themselves, deservingly earning Israel's hostility. And the same is true of some of the organisations that provide information to the various committees or commissions of inquiry. UNRWA, for example, which discredited itself when Peter Henson, his Commissioner General at, uh, at that time, claimed in 2002 in dozens of newspaper interviews that the battle in Janine, that in the Battle of Janine, Israel had caused, I quote, wholesale obliteration, a human catastrophe that has few parallels in recent history, helicopters strafing civilian residential areas and bodies piling up in mass graves, end of quote. In the event, the figures that can be listed as most favourable favorable even to what Hansen said are these. 23 Israeli soldiers and 59 Palestinians killed, around half of whom were civilians. Last week, a member of the audience drew attention to the fact that Israel had prevented Richard Falk, uh, a UN special rapporteur uh, on Palestinian human rights, from entering Gaza. Falk has a history of unremitting hostility to Israel and claimed indeed that Israel's crimes were comparable to the crimes of the Holocaust. In an article in Le Monde Diplomatique, it's easily available on the web, he asked, I quote, is it an irresponsible overstatement to associate the treatment of Palestinians with this criminalised Nazi record of collective atrocity? End of quote. The atrocity to which he refers is the Holocaust, not some event during the Holocaust. He answers, I think not. He goes on to say that the world's failure to recognise, I quote, the genocidal tendency in Israel's siege of Gaza, the siege of Gaza, I'm not talking about the invasion of Gaza, 
The siege of Gaza is, quote, morally worse than its failure to detect advanced signals of the genocide to come in Rwanda. In an interview for the BBC World News programme Hard Talk, the relevant portion of which you can see on YouTube, just Google Richard Falk, Falk regrets those words, but not because he's come to see how morally distasteful they are, but because, he said, they distract attention from the truth of his detailed allegations against Israel. And from that one can reasonably, if not infallibly, infer that he believed that at the time the truth of those allegations justified the claims about the Holocaust that I just reported. People may think that what Falk says is true and may justifiably condemn Israel for holding him in detention for 20 hours before putting him on a plane. Even so, or, and uh, also, and this is rather important, I admit, they might ask which, after all, is worse, to be a biased reporter on crimes or to be the person or the nation that committed those crimes, which is worse? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. But even so, is it surprising that Israel does not regard Falk as an impartial observer? Before Richard Falk, John Dugard was the UN Special Rapporteur on Palestinian Human Rights, and he too was known for his long-standing antipathy to Israel. He compared the building of the separation barrier, the wall as it's now more simply called, to apartheid. Only ignorance or malice, or both, could lead one to distort the complexities of Jewish identity of what it means to be a Jew, religious or secular, by claiming that to be a Jew is to be a member of a race in the sense that implies that the Jewish wish for a Jewish state was an expression of racialism with all the pejorative connotations of that term. If I'm not mistaken, it was Dugard's comment that led to the equation of Zion with racism that disgraced the UN Durban Conference. The claim, that is to say, that Zionism is intrinsically racist that racism is of Zionism's essence, a claim quite different, of course, from the probably true claim that for racist reasons common in colonial settler societies, the full humanity of the Palestinian Arabs was at best only partially visible to early Zionist settlers, and different too from the probably true claim that racism against the Palestinian Arabs now goes deep in Israeli society. But only racists or those who recklessly press an anti-Zionist agenda in a way that encourages anti-Semitism talk as Dugard did of the Jewish race. Dugard was recently appointed as chairperson of a committee called the Independent Fact-Finding Committee. It was formed by the Arab League and comprised six experts in international law. Its brief was to investigate whether Israel had committed war crimes after its invasion of Gaza. It was comprised of uh, uh, experts in criminal law and forensic medicine and, uh, as I said, was uh, constituted by the Arab League. The committee concluded that during its invasion of Gaza, Israel had committed war crimes, crimes against humanity and possibly genocide. The report is published but impossible to access on the web, or it was for me, but this is what Dugard wrote on June 17th in The Nation about the allegation that Israel may be guilty of genocide. I quote him. The IWFC investigated the question of whether the IDF, the Israeli Defence Force, was responsible for committing the crime of all crimes, genocide. Here we concluded that although the evidence pointed in this direction, Israel lacked the intention to destroy the people of Gaza, which must be proved for the crime of genocide. Instead, the IF IWFC found that the purpose of the offensive was collective punishment, aimed at reducing the population to a state of submission. However, the IWFC did not discount the possibility that individual soldiers had acted with the required genocidal intent. End of quote. I have no doubt that Israel committed war crimes, and it's credible that she also committed crimes against humanity, though I would be astonished if it did so to the degree that could justifiably justifiably sustain the outrage that many people felt when they compared Gaza with Israeli civilian casualties. And as I said, it's hard to know how there can be an accurate assessment of her alleged crimes in many cases, at least without an assessment of how the soldiers who are alleged to have committed those crimes saw the situation at the time. 
this subjective factor, as it's sometimes called, is fundamental to the concept that we use to identify those crimes. But put that aside for the moment. More relevant to the point I'm making is what Dugard says about genocide. He gives no reason whatsoever for suspecting that Israel's actions in Gaza expressed a genocidal intent. An intent, I'm now quoting uh, from the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, an intent, quote, to destroy in whole or in part an ethnical or racial group as such. The claim, therefore, that the committee had reason to investigate whether Israel is guilty of genocide is rather like saying that a policeman has reason to order a murder inquiry against a person, though there was no reason whatsoever to believe that she had an intent to kill the person whose death was the subject of the investigation. Dugard goes on, you'll call, to say that the committee found reason to believe that individual soldiers may have had the requisite intent, genocidal intention. It's hard to see how an individual in soldier in Gaza could form the intention, and I quote again, to destroy in whole or in part an ethnical or racial group as such. How could an individual soldier in Gaza form such an intention? He might, of course, massacre people with the thought that he is ridding the world of vermin, or with the thought, well, that's a few less Palestinians. But only a debased conception of genocide could take such thoughts as satisfying the requirement that the person who is guilty of genocide must have the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part as such. Of course, someone with a delusion of grandeur, quite literary delusions, could think that his mere wish that he could eliminate the Palestinians in whole or in part could itself count as the intention to do it in circumstances such as I described, that it could realistically count as a means to that end. But then, if wishes were horses, then beggars would ride. And that's partly why the murderous pogroms in Eastern Europe prior to the Holocaust, whose participants no doubt sometimes thought that in killing Jews they were ridding the world of vermin, were rightly not counted as examples of genocide. People who have been the victims of crimes, and this includes political crimes, hunger for justice to be done. And that, I believe, often requires the prosecution of those who committed the crimes. Many people who originally supported the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa say that it did not satisfy that desire for justice, and that they say that this unsatisfactory situation was compounded by the fact that no more truth and no more reconciliation were conceived than would have been the case had there been trials. Reports from Germany suggest the same in regard to Germany's decision not to prosecute Stasi criminals. A different story might have emerged from the former Czechoslovakia. But if justice is to be done to the victims of crimes, it is at least necessary to identify the perpetrators of those crimes and to give the right names to those crimes. Why then do I believe that there should not be prosecutions against Israeli politicians and soldiers? I have a number of reasons, but this is the most important one. Sixty years after the Holocaust, the Jewish state is a pariah amongst nations. There can be no doubt that she has committed crimes against the people she dispossessed when the state was established, and that she continues to commit crimes against them. It is, as I remarked earlier, Israeli historians who most compellingly dispel the illusion that things became seriously morally bad only after the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza in 1967. But nothing that Israel has done explains adequately and certainly does not justify why she now is the prior nation, subject to more antagonistic resolutions against her by the Security Council than any other nation, persistently under attack by human rights groups who often call for indictment for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and in some cases, as we've seen, genocide. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in European countries, and literally millions of Muslims throughout the world hate Jews with what, if one listens to their words, appears to be a murderous ferocity. She is the only state in the world whose injustice has given rise to serious doubts about her legitimacy. After she committed the worst crimes in history, Germany was divided, but she was allowed to remain Germany. In such circumstances, it strikes me as verging on the obscene to demand the prosecution of the Jewish state with the politicians and soldiers of the Jewish state 
for crimes con committed against an enemy sworn to her destruction and whose charter and education institutions profess a vile anti-Semitism. But it would seem to be equally verging on the obscene to press the case against her prosecution for the reasons I've just given, without insisting that she do just those things which, because she did not do them, denied her the right to claim she had no choice but to invade Gaza. She must lift the siege and do things which reveal a serious intent to allow the Palestinians to develop a state they can accept without humiliation. And that means more than putting a freeze on settlements. It means dismantling them. It means, I believe, indeed, putting the settlers on notice that Israel will negotiate with the Palestinian Authority a date for their departure. Most of all, it means fully acknowledging that Israel, the terrible wrong that Israel did to the Palestinians. And that, I believe, entails that she can no longer treat the West Bank as something to bargain with. As Gideon Levy has argued in Haaretz, to treat the occupation of the West Bank as a bargaining chip in negotiations is to be like someone who stole someone's property and then with a gun at her head sets the conditions under which he'll negotiate its return. Only if Israel does this, I think, will it be clear that she finally recognises the Palestinian people's need of a sovereign state in which they can develop the cultural and political institutions that will enable them to flourish as a people. And only then will her demand that Hamas renounce its charter and recognise the legitimacy of the Jewish state have the moral authority that it deserves that currently lacks. <laughs>